now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Luke, uh, one of the members here, um, and I get to close off the Book of One Thessalonians for you. Um, so Alex, my wife and I uh, moved house a few months back. Um, and prior to that, we didn't have a TV. And we didn't have a TV license either. Um, we spent a few months or years, maybe back and forth with the TV licensing agency, you know, trying to convince them, well, no, we don't have a television, so we don't need to pay for a license. Um, they weren't convinced for a little while. There's a lot of faff. So when we moved house, we thought, well, we're still not going to get a TV. But instead of going through all of that again, we're just going to get a TV license. Now, I don't know if you know or not, but if you don't have a TV license, you can't even watch BBC iPlayer. So a few shows passed us by. Um, one of them uh, being a show called uh, Line of Duty. And when we got a TV license, I was like, I can't watch iPlayer now. Let's see what, happened, what this, this whole sort of deal is with this, this film or TV show Line of Duty. So, you know, started up first couple of episodes. I'm there thinking, you know what? It's, it's not really all I've heard it's cracked up to be. I mean, it's character development's a bit kind of, they just throw you in at the deep end. And I don't really know who these people are. They're not really explaining it properly. And it feels like we're halfway through a storyline here. And yeah, um, some of you might have already cracked on. Uh, I started at season five. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'd missed a huge chunk of everything that had gone before. Uh, which is why it wasn't as good as, as everyone thought it was. And I don't know uh, how many of these uh, sermons you've been uh, here for in this series, but I don't know whether you're sort of feeling like you've come in at season five and you're like, okay, this is the last one. Um, yeah, what's, what's going to be in it for me? Everyone else has invested quite a lot of time into this series. Um, or maybe you're like me and you genuinely can't remember much of what happened in the first one back in September. Um, it was a little while ago. We've had a few intermissions since. So I thought um, I'd just give a quick, brief recap. Uh, so we're all on the same page um, and we can go into tonight's passage together. Um, so uh, the founding of the church um, in Thessalonica or Thessalonica, it's one of the two. I don't know, um, is written about in the book of Acts in chapter 17. Paul and his associates uh, preached the good news um, about Jesus, and a large number of people believed and formed the church there. However, Paul and his team uh, were chased out of town by the local religious authorities who incited a mob against them and had them arrested. Uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians is written by Paul to those believers left in Thessalonica, People were facing the same persecution and opposition uh, that Paul had faced, um, but they didn't get the chance to flee. They lived there. In chapter one, uh, I think Neil uh, brought us chapter one. Paul prays uh, for the Thessalonians, giving thanks for them, for their faith, and encourages them to hold fast to their first love for Jesus. 
that in doing this, they and we will be able to face persecution and remain solid in following Christ. Uh, Tim Howlett then helpfully took us through uh, most chapter two with Paul instructing the Thessalonians and us to live with integrity, keeping the gospel message pure uh, and living what we're teaching, to live with intentionality, intentionality, um, being proactive in how we go about looking for talking to people about Jesus and looking after other Christians, uh, to listen to instruction, to sit under those who teach us and ultimately under the word of God and to be imitators both of Paul of Christian role models and of Christ. Uh, Alan then wrapped up chapter two and into chapter three, where Paul has sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage the, Thess the Thessalonians in their walk. But actually, Timothy comes back and reports they're doing really well. Uh, they are standing firm in their faith in Jesus and facing into the persecution that is set against them. Uh, and then Craig uh, took us through chapter four and Paul's instructions to them about a holy living in an unholy world, how they were to remain distinct from the culture around them, uh, to stay strong in not indulging in the sins of their surroundings, but to live in a way that is pleasing and glorifying to God. And then last week, uh, Mark unpacked Paul's response to a Thessalonian question about what happens to those who die before Jesus returns. And uh, Paul explains how our future hope is in Christ. Those who die in him will be raised uh, with us when he returns. So after that whistle stop tour, uh, we'll get into uh, chapter five, verses 12 to 28. Um, uh, so Paul actually packs this section uh, quite full of instructions for the Thessalonians. Uh, almost every verse uh, is a sermon in itself. Um, it's almost as if the person delivering the letter is, is there kind of going, come on, Paul, <laughs> get to the end. I'm leaving in five, five minutes, four minutes now. Um, you've only got a few minutes left. Get, get a move on. Um, and, and Paul was kind of rushing through, just blurting out everything he wants to say onto, onto the page. Um, uh, many of the points are actually developed later on in um, Paul's future letters to other churches. Uh, they go into a lot more depth in, into those. Uh, but I think the main focus is that Paul wants to get across to the church in Thessalonica uh, and to us today in Helly Park Church and Phillips Street Chapel are the importance of three things. Uh, fellowship with your leaders, fellowship with each other, and fellowship with God. So we'll start off with fellowship uh, with your leaders. Um, Fittingly, on Remembrance Sunday, and with our title, um, our series title, Life on the Front Line, uh, we can compare ourselves to a company uh, of soldiers. For a company of soldiers to work effectively, uh, it needs to follow the orders of its leadership. While in the army, leadership is appointed to you, you don't get to choose, and um, following orders is expected uh, as strong uh, punishment for not following orders. Uh, it certainly helps if those who are placed in leadership over the soldiers are also respected and the company wants to follow them. In the setting of churches, uh, we have uh, both Hedley Park and Phillip Street had to think about church leadership recently. Uh, and while the processes might not have been identical, uh, they likely followed a similar framework uh, using Paul's first letter to Timothy as guidance. In it, he says, uh, in chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Both of our churches have sought out men that hold up to these criteria, and have done so in a prayerful way. 
it rightly took months uh, before the appointments were finalized with plenty of steps in between, lots of prayerful consideration. Now, remembering that Paul had to leave Thessalonica before he, he had intended to, and after such a short stay, uh, we read in Acts 17 that he went into the synagogue on three Sabbaths. It's, it's not very long. We know that the church leaders that were left behind while meeting the majority of the criteria from 1 Timothy were likely to have been recent converts by necessity, which means that there could have been a temptation for uh, the church members to look at the people left in charge and start thinking, well, who are they to be the leaders of this church? I mean, they've only been a Christian as long as I have. Who are they to tell me what to do and how to live my life? I mean, we know, don't we? Nobody likes being told what they can and cannot do. It's part of our uh, sinful nature to just do what we want and to ignore those who want to help us. Especially if, if the person that's telling us, you know, a few weeks beforehand had been a complete stranger to us, maybe even one of our peers. But this... This is the situation the Thessalonian church found itself in. So Paul here is telling the church uh, that the fellowship they have with those chosen to lead the new church is important. Those left in charge by Paul had been tasked with a great work. Look after and guard this fledgling church in the face of great persecution. Lead them through the difficult times and difficult surroundings full of temptation and opportunity to stumble. And actually, the last thing they need while leading the church is to face opposition from within as well. Paul states that the hard work of these church leaders should be acknowledged. that They should be held in the highest regard by the rest of the church. And that there should be peace between membership and leadership. Actually, this is probably one of the most straightforward applications that we, we, we get from some of Paul's letters, certainly one that I've been given to preach on. It doesn't take much to see how we should act in the same way as Paul instructs the church in Thessalonica, especially as both churches find themselves at the beginning uh, of new chapters in their leadership. We're to realise the hard work that our leaders do for us as churches. The long hours they spend, uh, not only pastoring the church and preparing teaching, uh, but the time they spend praying for us, the time weighing up decisions, finding out what is right, what's God's will for the church, the great burden of love they carry for us. We're to acknowledge there's this in the way we interact with them, uh, the way we look after them as employers. We should make sure that they are compensated adequately and that their workload isn't unbearable. We should also give them times of sabbatical, honouring their days off uh, that, um, that they get. I don't know if you know or not, but our church leaders aren't employed seven days a week. <laughs> hmm. um, they have days off, and actually it's, it's within our ability as a membership to honour those days and you know, go to them with urgent things, certainly they wouldn't want us to uh, hold off from uh, those urgent life-changing things that happen. But actually, if it's not something that is urgent, if it's something that can wait, let's wait. Paul says we should hold them in the highest regard. Now, thankfully, uh, this doesn't mean that we should venerate them uh, put them on a pedestal uh, and consider them to be superior to us in every way, which I'm personally quite thankful for. Uh, having um, sung on a number of occasions a song about a certain uh, senior pastor and items of clothing chose to wear or didn't choose to wear, um, you can come and see me afterwards to make that make more sense. Um, and having on numerous occasions recreated scenes from WWE with another 
certain pastor um, over the back of a sofa, um, I think I'd be in trouble if we were to venerate our pastors. Uh, but thankfully, it doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that we should take seriously the position they have over us. They have been uh, called uh, and guided by God to shepherd his people, to provide spiritual oversight over us. They are to build us up in Jesus. They are to teach us his word and prepare us for our lives on the front line. They are to ensure that we're better equipped to share the gospel with those we meet day in, day out. And yes, they're to reprimand us when we wander from God. We should heed their words of warning and listen to them. We're to test their lives against what they say and what they do and make sure they match. We're to uphold them in our prayers for the difficult jobs that they have been given to do. Thirdly, Paul says we're to live in peace with them. I've had the privilege, and um, it really is a privilege, of attending churches where every step of my life, the leadership and the membership have been working in unison towards the same goals, always pulling in the same direction. And it's been a real blessing. And I'm eternally thankful to to God for that. Uh, For some of you, uh, you know firsthand what it's like uh, when um, there's a rift between the two, when the leadership of the church and the membership of the church aren't pulling in the same direction, where there is conflict, where there is pain, where there's heartache, even schism and separation. Paul's saying where possible and where biblical, we should seek to be at peace, looking for common ground with those who lead us. They know they will have to answer to God for how they have uh, shepherded his people during their time in leadership. So we should do all we can to make sure the task is as frictionless as possible, being willing to sit under their authority and uh, their leadership. Uh, There's a book um, which I think has probably come out uh, a few times um, from this pulpit, but I was going to do it again just because, why not? It's called The Book Your Pastor Wishes You Read, uh, but is too embarrassed to ask. Uh, It's a great book. I haven't got all the way through it yet, so it's a great book so far. There we go. That's that's more factually accurate. Um, But it's about what it's like. It's written by a pastor. Uh, it's, it's, it's about what it's like to be a pastor, the struggles, the strains, the concerns, the challenges, um, and what it is that the membership can do to make their life not easier, but, yeah, easier <laughs> in a godly way. Um, so if you haven't read that, when I've finished, um, come and see me, and you're more than welcome to borrow it. Um, but, yeah, it's well worth a read so far. Um, Excellent. So as well as highlighting the importance of fellowship between church and its leadership, um, Paul also states um, that the uh, fellowship uh, between each other, between the church members, should not be underestimated. Uh, He says uh, in verse 14 and 15, we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Uh, Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but try always to be kind to each other and to everyone else. With the short time frame of the formation of the Thessalonian church, Paul would have realized that these are people uh, from varying situations, circumstances, uh, and people facing different struggles. Here he urges the wider church, and possibly even uh, those stronger in the faith, to take responsibility for their new family. Initially, uh, it seems to make sense that this section is written for the church leadership, uh, but actually if we take the whole of the message of 1 Thessalonians together, uh, along with verse 27, uh, where he says, I urge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters, then it makes sense that this urging 
in verses 14 and 15 uh, is for all the church and not just the leadership. Going back to our army metaphor, any given time, different members of a military company uh, will be um, will need different treatment to be more effective. Uh, there's no way the generals can talk to every man or woman in the in the army individually. Some of them uh, will need a stern word from a sergeant. Some of them need a word of encouragement from a fellow private. Some will need to see a medic about their injuries. Soldiers don't usually uh, sit by uh, idly while their fellows struggle because they know it impacts the effectiveness of the unit as a whole. They'll look out for each other and don't leave, every, uh, don't leave everything up to those in charge. Similarly with the Thessalonians, just because there are men appointed to lead the church, it doesn't absolve the rest of them from their duties to look after each other as well. There are those who are idle, who maybe need to be given a nudge in their walk with the Lord. Those who are frightened and timid, who need encouragement uh, to stand up and be counted as part of the church of Jesus, and then supported uh, when the likely persecution follows. There are those who are falling into the sins that Paul has talked about earlier in the letter. Uh, they need to be helped. They need to be um, helped through them and shown that living for Jesus is infinitely better uh, than the short-term pleasures of this life. And it's no coincidence that these things sound familiar, is it? Without going into detail, we, we know that we have brothers and sisters in our churches that fall into these categories. And actually, to be honest, we all do to a greater or lesser extent from time to time, or at least I, I certainly know I do. So if we're feeling strong in our faith, if we're in a season of blessing and we see a need, let's be the ones who step out and step up to help whether it's practical support, whether it's prayer, whether it's just being there for someone going through a difficult time, knowing there's someone they can speak to and uh, just talk these things through, someone who will listen to them and not judge them. Let's not leave it all to the church leaders, but where appropriate, let's get involved and share the burden. And those times when we're weak and we're in need, let's not suffer in silence, uh, but realize that we um, can reach out to our brothers and sisters in the church and ask for help and be willing to accept it, whether it's support, whether it's rebuke, whether it's encouragement that our situation requires. But all of these things require a trust. We need to be a church uh, that know each other. It's not just a collection of individuals uh, who meet on a Sunday and then disperse. We, we need to do life together, don't we? We need to get to know each other and spend time uh, with each other outside of these four walls so we can grow closer together. That way, when things happen to us, we feel able uh, to reach out. When we see someone straying or, or struggling, we feel suitably connected to them to be able to step in and, and ask them if they need help. We need to work on that fellowship with each other that enables us to be effective in our collective goal of reaching our community for Jesus. And with a number of people from Headley Park moving across to Phillips Street, there are likely going to be people who have some of their existing support network moving away. We can't assume just because someone's been here at the church for a long time that they've got everything sorted, that they've got those people. We need to be looking for deepening our relationships uh, with those people who are new and those people who have been here for a while. Uh, let's look out for those in our churches who might be finding it difficult to connect people who often uh, sit on the edge and don't get involved in conversations. Let's look out for those people who um, maybe are lacking in those supports. Let's make sure that no one in our churches is isolated. So when the hard times come, they just fall away. 
So we've looked at why fellowship with our leaders and fellowship with each other are important, but underpinning all these things and the most important of all is fellowship with God. This is what distinguishes the church from just another social club that meets on any given day, any given time for any given activity. There isn't just a fellowship amongst us, but a fellowship between us and God. In verses 16 to 22, Paul headlines what they should look like. He says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. Do not put the Spirit's fire out. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. And I count at least nine different sermons in, in that passage alone, so I, I don't know how long you've got. Um, it, it, I said at the beginning, it feels like a whistle-stop tour of, of Paul's other letters, and why not? Paul may have expanded on these points at later times in the future letters to other churches, but they're all still valid. Be joyful always and give thanks in all circumstances. In the light of what God has saved us from and to, how could we not be? We, have always, we always have reason to be joyful and be thankful. Yes, there are tough times that we face, and that doesn't undermine or uh, paper over those difficulties. But when compared to the eternity of life with God himself, we should be joyful always. Pray continually. Your Father in heaven loves to hear your prayers. You should want to speak to him often. No relationship can exist with, with a lack of communication. If the two parties never speak. So pray. Pray about the big things that feel like they're about to overwhelm you. Pray about choices that you're given in life, the big ones. Pray that they would fit best with your walk with the Lord. Pray about the small things, conversationally, when you're walking down the street. Bring your requests to God. Give thanks to him for all he has done for you. Whatever you do, pray. Do not put the Spirit's fire out. That first excitement you had when you became a Christian, don't let it wilt. When you first heard the gospel and responded and wanted to share it with everyone you met, Keep that fire inside you. Remind yourself of the gospel daily. Preach to yourself when you wake up in the morning. Remind yourself of Jesus, his life for you, his death for you, and his glorious resurrection. Jesus, the man who was God. The cross where your judgment now sits and the empty tomb. Be excited to tell other people about Jesus. Hold on to that excitement and, and be eager to share your faith with others. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Whatever you hear from the pulpit, from fellow Christians giving you advice, from theological books you read, from YouTube channels you watch, from wherever it is you get your input as a Christian, don't assume that it's false, but don't assume that it's true. Don't throw it away immediately, but don't treat it as gospel. Test it against the word of God. If it holds up to what you know about God, what the Bible says about him, then keep it, hold on to it. And if it doesn't, throw it away. And if you're not sure, seek the advice of other Christians. Look at it together, see if you can work out between you what it, what it says, whether it's good or bad. Hold on to the good, avoid all kinds of evil. I mean, those seem quite self-explanatory. Um, so in the interest of time, hold on to the good, avoid all, all kinds of evil. These things will help you in your fellowship with God. Build it up so that prayer becomes second nature, where joy is a hallmark of your life, even through tough times, where you become a walking advert for Jesus. where people who know you see Jesus in you. When they think this is what it's like 
This is what it looks like to follow him. And I want to have that too. But actually, Paul here um, isn't just talking about us individually. He's talking about us corporately as a church. The fellowship between the church and God is also vital. As a body of God's people, we should reflect that which we worship. We should be Christ-like and draw people in. There should be a joyfulness about how we do church together, a prayerfulness about how we approach decisions we have, how we discern where God is leading us as a collective. Our churches should be places where uh, the voice of God is heard from the pulpit, not the voice of men. And it's followed even when the message is difficult or countercultural. As long as it conforms to what the Bible says when it's tested. We should be places where good is upheld and celebrated, not just because it's uh, not, sorry, not just because of its goodness, but because it reflects Christ. And where evil is avoided and confront, confronted in all its forms and driven out. Paul urged the, Thess the Thessalonians, as he urges us today, to become a church that has strong bonds of fellowship uh, with those in leadership, with each other, and with God. I don't know about you, but Sometimes, to me, Sunday evenings feel like a bit of a calm before the storm. Sometimes I can, I can stand here or sit there and think about Monday morning. Sometimes it feels like that quiet moment before something big happens. Almost a bit like I imagine it felt for World War I soldiers in the trenches, in that pause after the big guns had stopped, but before the whistle blew. Monday morning, that whistle's going to come. Uh, you'll be called to go into whatever situation it is you're facing at the moment, but you do not go alone. Uh, you have a church of people who can uphold you in prayer, who can offer practical support for you. Um, there are even people who have, who have already faced what you are facing who can tell you that God will, draw you, will bring you through it. And much more than that, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead at work in your life. He's working for your good and for God's glory. If you are a Christian, you have your name written in the book of life and are held in the palm of a God who will never let you go no matter what happens. So tomorrow morning, as we go on the front line, let's go out there in the power of God uh, to live for him and to glorify his name. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you um, that you, um, that you love us, uh, Lord, that you um, give us um, your word that we can, uh, we can read about people who lived uh, thousands of years ago, but who faced the same struggles we face today. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, people who, like Paul, uh, were guiding young churches uh, that were telling them about how to live for you. Uh, we thank you that that word has been preserved, uh, that we can use it today to, uh, to model ourselves on, uh, that we can be encouraged um, uh, by these words. We can, we can see how it is that you want us to live, both individually and corporately. Uh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us the strength uh, to go out into this week uh, to live for you uh, to tell people about jesus to face uh, our struggles and to overcome them in your power amen <laughs>